The main point of this class is to learn how to prepare two financial statements – balance sheet, sheet and profit and loss account. There are three parts in this class and the last part is for higher level students only. But if you are a standard level student, again, you can watch, I'm not gonna tell anyone. The first part is purpose – purpose of final accounts to different stakeholder groups. The second part is final accounts – profit and loss account and balance sheet. sheet. And the last part is depreciation – this is for AHL only, and here we'll learn two methods how to calculate depreciation. As always, please like this video, subscribe and have a look at assessment objectives before we start learning new stuff. In the first part of this class, we're going to talk about the purpose of final accounts to different stakeholder groups. First of all, let's figure out what final accounts are. The two types of final accounts are balance sheet – that shows how much the organization is worth if it was to be sold – and profit and loss account, which shows how well firm is trading. It shows different kinds of profit – net profit and gross profit. So, all you need to understand for now is that balance sheet shows how much organization is worth and profit and loss account shows how much profit organization is making. The second part of this issue is stakeholders. Because we are talking about the purpose of final accounts – balance sheet and profit and loss account – to different stakeholder groups. If you have no idea what stakeholders are, then please review 1.4. If you do know who stakeholders are, and what the different kinds of internal and external stakeholders are, then you can just spend a moment thinking why different stakeholder groups might be interested in final accounts. Why would they want to know how much organization is worth and how well organization is doing in terms of profits. If you have no ideas, then you have me and I'm going to tell you why different stakeholder groups might be interested in final accounts. If we're talking about companies, then their owners are called shareholders. Owners of companies are shareholders. Their main interest would be how much dividends are we getting? How well is company performing? Because companies' profits and revenues are related to dividends. If we're talking about unlimited liability organizations, which are partnerships and sole traders, you can review 1.2 if you don't understand what I'm talking about. Some organizations have unlimited liability and they do not have shareholders, they just have owners. So owners also would be interested in different final accounts because they want to know how much of the profits is attributed to them. The next stakeholder group is managers. Managers are the ones who get things done in an organization and final accounts serve as evidence of their work. For example, if you use profit and loss account and you compare gross profit and net profit, then you will see how well an organization is controlling its expenses. Who is charge of controlling expenses? Managers. So, in this way, Final accounts, balance sheet and profit and loss account can serve as evidence of good or bad work that managers do. Employees might be interested in final accounts because they want to see how secure their jobs are. They can assess organization's performance using balance sheet and profit and loss account and they might see how secure their future is. Is organization doing well or is it not doing well? Is it a good time to ask for a raise or is it not a good time? With regards to governments, all that government cares about is tax and law. So they want to make sure that tax is being paid on time, fully, and the organization is not involved in any illegal accounting practices. Competitors might be also interested in each other's final accounts. This way they can see their relative success or relative failure, they can see the industry benchmarks and they can understand their relative market standing and market power compared to each other. As we learned in 3.2, creditors or suppliers very often provide some goods, some raw materials to their debtors on credit. They give it to them now, but they ask for payment later. So if suppliers can have a look at final accounts, they might see how likely their debtors are paid back for their trade credit. If you forgot what trade credit is, please review 3.2 Sources of Finance. With regards to customers, they're not really that interested in dividends 
or financial performance, but some really well-educated customers who took IB business management might actually have a look at final accounts and see how ethical organization is, how it spends their profits. Does it donate parts of its profits to some charitable contributions or not? Or does it only exist to make its owners wealthier? And with regards to pressure groups, they go beyond law, they go beyond government, they want to see how ethical organizations are. If they see that parts of the profits are distributed to something that harms the environment or the society in general, then they might make this information public, they might use media to put pressure on the organizations in order to change organizational behavior or customer behavior or government policy. Once again, if you forgot who stakeholders are, please review 1.4. I've just given you some examples of questions that different stakeholder groups can ask when they inquire about different organizations' final accounts. Now, in the next part of class, we'll finally talk about what final accounts are, balance sheet and profit and loss account. In this most important part of class 3.4, we're going to learn how to prepare profit and loss account and balance sheet. Let's start with profit and loss account. So, this is a financial statement that shows organizations trading activity over a year. Actually, it doesn't have to be a year, but in most cases it's over a year. The purpose of profit or loss account is, surprise, surprise, to show whether an organization is making profits or loss. Keep in mind that if organization is non-profit, then it's not called profit, it's called surplus. So in their case, the purpose would be to see whether organization is making surplus or loss. There are three parts in profit and loss account. They are called trading account that shows gross profit, profit statement that shows net profit, and appropriation account that shows retained profits and dividends for for-profit organizations. We'll learn profit and loss account in these three parts. Before we move on, please have a look at this. This is how IB wants you to present profit and loss account for for-profit entities and non-profit entities. As you can see, in the document it's not called profit and loss account. It's called statement of profit or loss. So, whenever you prepare profit and loss account in your exam or for your homework, please label it, please call it as statement of profit or loss not profit and loss account. I know it's confusing, but there's nothing we can do about it. So the first part of profit and loss account is called trading account. Its purpose is to show gross profit. Gross profit is the difference between revenues and the cost of purchasing or producing the products that, that are sold. The formula for gross profit is revenue minus cost of sales. Cost of sales is direct cost of products sold. It's called cost of sales in general, or you can call it cost of sales for services and COGS, cost of goods sold for goods. So basically COGS and cost of sales refer to the same thing, but cost of sales is a more general word. COGS is something that you use when you talk about goods only. Remember that products can be goods and services, right? So cost of sales for services or for everything, COGS for goods only. The formula for cost of sales is opening stock plus purchases minus closing stock. I know it might seem confusing at this point, but as you listen to the example, it should be much clearer. So opening stock is the cost of stock of raw materials or finished goods at the beginning of the trading period. For example, if your trading period is one day, then the cost of your stock at the start of the day in the morning is opening stock. Purchases is the cost of supplies, cost of deliveries that are made in the middle within the trading period. So if we're talking about one day as a trading period, then if you get a delivery in the afternoon, that would be purchases. And closing stock is the value of stock at the end of trading period. If trading period is one day, that would be the cost of your stock at night when you close your shop. Stock here has nothing to do with shares. We are talking about stocks of finished goods or raw materials. Stock of things that you're gonna sell later. So if you own a fruit shop, 
then your stocks would be fruit. Now let's try calculating COGS. Imagine that the trading period is one day. In the morning, Ivan's fruit stall has $100 worth of fruit in stock. At lunch, he receives more fruit from his supplier that he will sell later, and the cost of this supply is $150. At night, when Ivan closes his shop, he only has $80 worth of fruit in stock. So calculate COGS. Maybe you want to pause this video and calculate it before you move on. If you don't want to pause this video, then here's the answer. If we apply the formula, as you can see, the answer would be $170. So cost of goods sold or cost of sales for Ivan that day is $170. Now let's calculate gross profit and let's assume that Ivan is a brilliant businessman and he manages to sell his fruit for the price that is four times of the stock value. Again, you might want to pause this video or just continue and see the answer. So the formula is gross profit equals revenue minus cost of sales. Revenue is four times of the stock value, 170 times four, and cost of sales is 170. So this way, gross profit is $510. This is Ivan's gross profit for that day. I hope now it's clear what is gross profit, what is revenue, what is COGS or cost of sales. Trading account looks like this sales revenue, cost of sales, gross profit. So this picture is just an extract of the entire profit and loss account. This is just trading account, the first part. The second part of profit and loss account is called profit statement, or if no profit is being made, it's called loss statement. It shows net profit. Net profit is the difference between gross profit and expenses. The formula is net profit equals gross profit minus expenses. Expenses are indirect and or fixed costs, for example, rent or internet fee or salaries. If you don't remember the types of costs, then please watch the previous class, 3.3. Now, net profit can be before interest and tax and after interest and tax. Sometimes students ask me, why is interest and tax not just included in expenses? Expenses is something that you can control directly or indirectly, but interest rate and tax is something that you have no control over. You cannot just call the government and tell them, hey, I'm not going to pay 13%, I'm going to pay 10 just because I want to. That is why it's not included in expenses and in profit and loss account, it is shown separately to show that this is something that you don't have control over. So net profit can be before interest and tax and after interest and tax. Now let's use the same example of Ivan's fruit stall and let's try to calculate net profit for Ivan before and after interest and tax. In 2022, Ivan sold $60,000 of fruit stock with a market value of $230,000. He paid $40,000 rent that year and $30,000 for electricity and water bills. He also paid $25,000 for other overheads, such as internet fee and cleaning. Calculate net profit for Ivan. Now maybe you pause the video or just see the answer that is coming in 3, 2, 1, now. Net profit is gross profit minus expenses. Gross profit is 230 minus 60 equals 170,000. Expenses are 40 for rent, 30 for electricity and 25 for other overheads. So overall expenses are 95,000. That is why net profit is 170 minus 95 and it's $75,000. If we put it on a real profit and loss account, then it's gonna look like this. Expenses, 95. Profit before interest and tax, $75,000. Now let's say in addition to these expenses, Ivan also paid $12,000 for interest and he paid 13% tax. Let's calculate net profit after interest and tax. Are you ready? It's gonna be this. Interest, 12,000. Corporate tax is 13% after expenses and interest is paid. So it's 13% of 63,000, which is 8,190. Overall net profit after interest and tax, which is indicated as profit for period 
is 54,800. 10. So let me summarize. So far you already know what trading account is, the first part of profit and loss account. You know what profit statement is, the second part of profit and loss account. And now let's talk about the third part, which is called appropriation account. This is probably the easiest part. It just shows two things. It shows how much profit is retained and how much dividends are paid. Keep in mind that in non-profit entities there are no dividends, there is just retained surplus. Let's assume that Ivan's business has become a privately held company and he promised his shareholders to pay one-fourth or 25% of net profits as dividends and the remaining is retained profits. Having understood that, let's prepare the full profit and loss account for Ivan. Full profit and loss account for Ivan is coming in 3, 2, 1, now! There you go, you already know profit for period, one quarter of it is dividends, 13,702.5, and the remaining is retained profits, 41,107.5. That's it, this is what profit and loss account is, these are the three parts of profit and loss account, trading account, profit statement, appropriation account. Before we move on, please have a look at the format of profit and loss account that is required by the IB. Please mind the difference between for-profit entity and non-profit entity. Before we move on to balance sheet, let's reflect a little bit on profit and loss account as a business tool. On the one hand, it breaks down trade and activity into the most important elements. It's really easy, clear to understand, it doesn't take much time to calculate. In addition to that, it helps to make comparisons between gross profit and net profit. Why is it important? Because when you compare the difference, you can see how much, how large the expenses are, and you can see whether you are taking good control over your expenses or not. So, overall, the main advantage of profit and loss account is that it's a very good indicator of organization's trading activity. On the other hand, this is a final account, which means that it's based on past data, which means that it's backwards looking, so it's actually not appropriate for predictions, because it's only based on past performance. It's not really reflective of the current reality, and definitely not really useful for the future. In addition to that, profit and loss account has some room for window dressing. Window dressing is legal manipulation of final accounts that is usually done in order to impress shareholders or clients or creditors. For example, you can increase your profit by recording sale of assets as profits. If you sell your assets, you're not really doing what you're supposed to do, you're not selling your product, you're selling your assets. However, these can be recorded as profit, you can show higher profits and shareholders will be impressed. Is it legal? Mm, well, yeah. Is it ethical? No, it's not. Overall, the main drawback of profit and loss account is that it's not perfect. It still has some room for unethical practices and some manipulation with numbers. That's all with regards to profit and loss account. Now let's see what balance sheet is. <coughs> Balance sheet is a financial statement of an organization's assets, liabilities and capital at a particular point in time. Think of balance sheet as of a picture, a photograph, a snapshot. It's just a picture at a point of time, so it's not really dynamic. It just indicates the reality at a point when it was made. Same as a picture, same as a photograph. Balance sheet is a requirement for all companies, they have to do it. Keep in mind that companies are not the only type of organization, review 1.2 if you forgot what other types of business entities there are. Similar to profit and loss account, in balance sheets there are three parts, but they are different, of course. They are assets, liabilities and equity. We'll talk about all three parts one by one. Why balance sheet is called balance sheet? What is the balance thing about? Net assets, which is the difference between all assets and all liabilities, should balance with equity, which means that sources of finance, equity, should balance with how they are spent. Net assets. That is why it's called balance sheet. If it doesn't make sense now, 
hold on, let's go through all three parts of balance sheet and I'm sure it'll be much clearer. Here you can see how IB wants you to prepare balance sheet. This is the format that is required by IB. Please mind the difference between profit-making entities and non-profit entities. Check out my website and my Instagram account. There you can save a picture or make a beautiful screenshot of the balance sheet that I drew myself. So the first part of the balance sheet is called assets. Assets are the items of property that are owned by an organization. Assets can be current and non-current. Current assets are the ones that last for less than 12 months, less than one year. Usually current assets are cash, debtors and stock. Cash refers to cash, <laughs> I don't have to explain that. Debtors refers to other businesses that owe you money and stock refers to stock of raw materials and finished goods that are just about to be sold so all of these assets they last for less than one year that is why they are called current assets non-current assets or fixed assets they last for more than one year the examples of non-current assets are cars, machinery, buildings, land, and etc. Anything that an organization owns for more than one year. Total assets is a sum of current assets and non-current assets. The second part of balance sheet is liabilities. You're just a liability, CJ! Liabilities is money owned by business to its lenders and suppliers. Liabilities can also be current and non-current. Current liabilities are, again, similar to assets, the ones that last for less than a year. For example, short-term loans, such as overdrafts. Creditors are also an example of liabilities. Non-current liabilities, or long-term liabilities, are the ones that are payable after one year, more than 12 months. So, feel free to use one-year rule to distinguish between current and non-current assets and liabilities. Works for both assets and liabilities. 12 months rule, one year. And again, similar to assets, total liabilities equals to current liabilities plus non-current liabilities. Now, once you know what assets are and what liabilities are, you should know what net assets are. Net assets are all assets minus all liabilities. So this is the difference between everything an organization owns and everything an organization owes. These are net assets. The last part is equity. Equity is the value of all assets if they were liquidated. Liquidated means transformed into cash. Cash is the most liquid asset. It's like water in business. So if we transform all the assets into cash, if we sell all the assets, that would be equity. That would be the value of organization. That would be the number that the organization is worth if it was to be sold, if it was to be liquidated. For profit-making entities, equity consists of share capital and retained earnings. You already know what retained earnings are, profits that are retained within a business, and share capital is the part of organization's capital that comes from the sale of shares. This is how much money you raise through selling shares. For non-profit entities, there are no shareholders, there are no shares, that is why their equity consists of retained earnings only. Now, as I said before, why balance sheet is called balance sheet is because net assets balance with equity. Now just think about it. Net assets is everything that an organization owns minus all debts that it has. At the same time, net assets mathematically are the same as equity. Equity is how much organization is worth. Does it make sense now that how much organization is worth equals to everything that organization owns, everything that it has, minus its debts? I think it makes perfect sense. That is why if you're struggling with remembering the order of items in a balance sheet, you should think about that. First, it's what the organization has. Second, it's all the debts that organization has to pay. And lastly, it's how much the organization is worth 
based on assets minus liabilities. There is no need to memorize balance sheet without putting any sense into it. Just think about it and try to apply logic in understanding what balance sheet represents. Everything you have minus all the debts equals how much you are worth. Isn't it beautiful? Now let's reflect about balance sheet a little bit. On the one hand, it's a perfect accounting tool to show how much organization is worth at a particular point in time. In addition, this is a document that helps to make sure all assets and liabilities are accounted for, are recorded. So overall, balance sheet is a wonderful accounting tool to show how much organization is worth and to make sure that net assets balance with equity. On the other hand, balance sheet is a snapshot. It's just a picture at a point of time. It's not representative of the dynamic business environment and of change that organization is constantly experiencing. In addition to that, balance sheet is a little bit inaccurate because the value of assets that is recorded in a balance sheet is based on estimation. You can't know for sure the real exact market value of all the assets. So overall, balance sheet is something that also leaves some room, some space for manipulation and unethical practices. Remember, ethics is the foundation of accounting. This part of class is for higher level students only, but again, if you're a standard level student, you can stay, I'm not gonna tell anyone that you're learning higher level stuff. Over time, some assets will appreciate in price. For example, imagine that you bought an office in downtown of, I don't know, New York. Do you think 10 years later this office will cost more or less? I'm quite sure it will cost more, because the space in New York downtown is limited and property prices only tend to grow over time. But some assets will do the opposite. They will depreciate in price, their value will decrease. For example, if you buy a car. Once you bought a car and used it for, I don't know, a day or two, it already lost quite a lot of its value. So car would be a depreciating asset. Depreciation is really important and this is something that helps to assess the value of assets accurately. So depreciation should be recorded in order to produce accurate accounts. It is usually included in the expenses part of profit and loss account. There are several methods how to calculate depreciation. The two methods that are covered in IB business management are straight line method and units of production method. Let's talk about each method in detail and learn how to calculate depreciation with each method. Again, you might feel a little bit confused when I just explain how to do that, but once you see the example, it should be really clear and straightforward. So please be patient. Before we talk about each method, I would also like to make sure you understand the key terms that are associated with depreciation. First of all is purchase cost. This is really easy. This is how much money you spend when you purchase an asset. So when you buy a car or a delivery truck or a printer for your office building, whatever money you pay to purchase that asset would be purchase cost. Lifespan refers to how long an asset can last. So for a car, it can be, I don't know, five, 10 years. For building, it can be centuries. So different assets have different lifespan which refers to the period how long the asset can last. Residual value or scrap value refers to the value of an asset at the end of its lifespan. Book value is the value of an asset in the balance sheet. Whatever number is in the balance sheet would be book value. And market value refers to the estimated market price of the asset if it was to be sold at a particular point in time. Now, once you know these terms, we are ready to talk about the first method, which is called straight line method. This method is pretty easy and straightforward. If residual value, you already know what residual value is. If residual value is zero, then the formula for annual depreciation is purchase cost divided by lifespan. If you bought a phone for $1,000 and you plan to use it for five years and throw it away, then 1,000 divided by five equals 200. 
so annual depreciation is $200. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. If you plan to sell this asset at the end of its lifespan, then the formula would be different. It would be purchase cost minus residual value divided by lifespan. Let's say Andy bought a laptop for $2,500. Andy is a very rich boy. He thinks he'll just use this laptop for five years and then he'll throw it away. Can you calculate annual depreciation for Andy's laptop? You can pause this video and work it out or you can see the answer right now. <coughs> annual depreciation would be $500 and if we put it on a graph, then it would look like this. Now let's say Andy got really mature and now he knows the value of money and he decides that for his new laptop he's going to sell it for $500. In this case annual depreciation would be different. Are you ready to see the answer? It would be 400 and the graph would look like this. So overall straight line method is really easy, simple and it works really well when time matters because assets just get old. On the other hand, it's quite hard to apply straight line method to more complex assets that consist of different smaller components, for example, a factory building or some complex equipment. In addition to that, straight line method does not take account of any qualitative factors. It only has time, lifespan, residual value, that's it. Nothing qualitative is part of this equation. So, if for straight line method the main thing is time, for units of production method the main thing is usage. How much, how intensively you use this or that asset. With this method of calculating annual depreciation, you can actually calculate different depreciation for different time periods, for example, for different years. That would be more dynamic and more reflexive of reality. Keep in mind that there are different ways to calculate depreciation using this method. I'm using the one that personally I find really straightforward and easy. So the formula that I suggest is units of production rate, UPR, multiplied by actual quantity produced, where units of production rate, UPR, equals to purchase cost minus residual value divided by total quantity produced over lifespan. It might sound really complicated, believe me, it's not. Let's see the example first. So let's say Andy bought a printer for $1,000 so that he can print amazing pictures that he edits on his brand new laptop. The manufacturer guarantees that the printer can produce 10,000 pictures over its lifespan. Andy expects to print 500 pictures a year and he plans to use the printer for three years and then sell it for $200. Calculate annual depreciation using units of production method. Again, you can work it out on your own and pause the video, or you can just see the answer that comes in 3 seconds, 2 seconds, 1 second, now! So, first, UPR, unit of production rate, equals to purchase cost minus residual value divided by total quantity produced over lifespan, and that would be 0.08, or 8%. Annual depreciation is UPR times actual quantity produced, which would be 0.08 times 500 pictures, which would be $40. So actually, that printer does not depreciate much over a year because it's not being used much. It only loses $40 in its value. Let's continue our example and put some more variables into it. Now imagine Andy prints the same amount of pictures annually, 500, during the entire lifespan of the printer. Calculate overall depreciation for the printer's lifespan and think whether purchasing that printer was a good investment. If you haven't paused the video yet, then the answer comes out in 3, 2, 1, now. <coughs> overall depreciation is annual depreciation time lifespan, which would be $40, as we calculated before, times 3 years, which is $120. Residual value is the purchase cost minus overall depreciation, which would be $880. However, the market value of a second-hand three-year-old printer is $200, because it says that Andy plans to sell it for $200 after three years. 
So the answer is, it's a terrible investment. So if we use units of production method, we can see that purchasing that printer makes no sense. Actually, using this method, it will only depreciate by $120 in three years, but you cannot actually sell it for that price because the market value of three-year-old printers is $200. So probably Andy shouldn't have bought that printer. Now, this is something that you can do if you are considering purchasing something that can produce some kind of output. Maybe a hair dryer, you can still count the hours of air that it can blow, <laughs> or a printer, or an Insta Max camera, or whatever it's called, or anything that produces some sort of output. Think about something you want to buy and make a little research. See what the lifespan of this thing is and how much of output it can produce over lifespan. Now think about how long you want to use it and what the market value of a similar product at the end of their lifespan is. For example, you can use eBay or Amazon to see how much similar secondhand products cost at the end of their lifespan. Then calculate depreciation using units of production method and think whether purchasing that thing was a good idea. I'm sure you will actually be surprised. Don't tell your parents about it because they will stop buying stuff for you. That is all. You learned two methods how to calculate depreciation. One is based on time an asset is being used and it's called straight line method and the other one depends on usage rates, on how much you actually use, wear and tear an asset. It is called units of production method. I hope it was really helpful. Good luck in calculating depreciation. This is the end of 3.4. I hope before you turn off this video, you will like it, maybe leave a comment, subscribe, tell your friends about it, and most importantly, have a look at assessment objectives and think whether you achieved them or not.